we are drawn here this morning because we realize that there's something more or something missing that sends us searching in the dark, looking for answers, risking a question. We're drawn here this morning because God has touched us. God has given us hope. God has whispered our name. Here in this place, we journey toward grace and come to know that, that something more for which we are searching is revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. May his name be praised as we join together in our call to worship. Come and worship in wonder and awe. Let us seek the face of God. God invites us to come just as we are. We come longing to experience God's embrace. God wraps us in the loving arms of our Creator. We come hungry to encounter the Word. God feeds us the bread of life. We come parched for renewal and restoration. God quenches our thirst with living water. We come weary and worn. God shoulders our burdens and grants us peace. Come and worship. In wonder and awe, God reveals the divine self to us. We come as we are and are changed by God's love and grace. Give glory to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks this morning for the season of Lent during which you invite us to come, to examine, to confess, to be renewed, to be healed. We've begun this journey eagerly, anticipating that like Jesus in the wilderness, there are things which need to be lost so that better things can be found. Grant us courage to set aside all those easy answers and quick fixes that we look for in favor of your word that penetrates deep and transforms us. Enable us to see past the, the immediate satisfaction of our wants that we might instead choose the eternal fulfilling grace of your presence. Embolden our faith that we might trust you rather than all the false and empty promises of the age. Thank you for walking this journey with us. May we emerge from it prepared to serve you with renewed passion and joy. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
all through the night and panic grips my life I can rest I can rest in you when sorrow marks my day help me not be afraid I will trust I will trust in you when tears fall through the night my life I can rest I can rest in you I have a mind that collects uh, all kinds of useless uh, data. Well, maybe not totally useless, but uh, I find it fascinating. And for some reason, my, my brain catalogs this kind of information while it really kind of ignores. I can remember obscure little facts, but I can't remember my wife's birthday. So take that for what it's worth. Did you know, it's something I just found out recently, 35% of all Americans can recall all six Brady kids from the Brady Bunch, but only, and 25% can name all seven ingredients of the Big Mac, but only 14% can accurately name all 10 commandments. 80% of Americans know two off-beef patties of the Big Mac, whereas thou shalt not kill was known to fewer than six in 10 Americans. 62% know that pickles are an ingredient in McDonald's Big Mac hamburger, but less than half, 45%, can recall the commandment to honor thy father and mother. Only 43% of Americans recall that Bobby and Peter were part of the Brady Bunch, but they are more familiar to Americans than the least recalled commandments, which are remember the Sabbath and do not make any false idols. Even folks that go to worship on Sunday mornings at least once a week have a little bit of t trouble naming all ten of the commandments. Thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal are still less remembered with this group than the top two ingredients in a Big Mac, two all-beef patties, and lettuce. If it's hard for us to remember the Ten Commandments, then how are we ever going to obey them? In the prophets, God says there will come a time when they will no longer have to be taught, for I will write my law and my word upon their hearts. That was written thousands and thousands of years ago, and I'm afraid to a large degree we're still waiting for that time to come, for the word of God to truly be written upon our hearts. That's part of where we fail as the church. That's part of where we fail as Christians. 
So let us go to the Lord now and confess this and all of our other sins before God and before each other. We confess, O oh God, that we have wandered off the pathway as we have journeyed through Lent. We confess that we are stuck in the middle of lost sight of our good intentions. We made the vow to be in prayer for 15 minutes each day during Lent and find ourselves instead busier than ever, running from appointment to appointment, from cell phone to laptop. We talk with everyone but you. We confess that we've fallen short of our goal to eat better during this time of reflection and regrouping. As we have failed to stick to the plan we had to exercise faithfully as we journey with you during Lent, God of second chances, as we pause in the middle, shake us up, turn us forward to walk with you in the light of your love as we might ultimately share this light and love with others. My friends, hear this good news that God loves you no matter what. Take heart and have courage in the knowledge that the grace of God is yours. Therefore, in the knowledge that you have been granted new life through Christ our Lord, give praise and thanksgiving, because in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Most holy and gracious God, we know that you hear our prayers and there's great comfort in that. Knowing that you see each of us, that you know each of us personally, that you, that you already know the very deepest needs that we have. Still, you've told us to come to you in prayer and, and we do that faithfully, confidently, in all humility as not only we remember the needs we have, but as we present before you the needs of those among us, we pray this morning for the Atkins family, for Lucas, for Fulton. Lord, we enter into the stillness of prayer and we look at all these uh, days that are still yet stretching out before us, leading us to that glory and hope and promise of new life on Easter Sunday morning as those days stretch out toward Easter. Let us give our time to those who are in need of an encouraging visit or just sit down and listen to someone whose grief weighs very heavily upon them. Let us give of our talents to volunteer to serve where those talents can meet a need within our church, within our community. Give us the grace to give our gifts, acknowledging the abilities that we have honestly and sharing them with those who need what it is we have to offer. And then help us to be silent and still and discover even more gifts and even, even greater ways of sharing. Open our eyes to the needs of those that live near us, those that live across the sea. Open our hearts to feel the pain of need. This is all the work of Lent, Heavenly Father, stretched out on our own cross so that we might know the joy of new life that Easter promises. So let us live and so let us give of ourselves through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Kids, kids, wake up, wake up. It's Sunday. We gotta get ready for church. Brian, Brian, wake up, honey. Brian, get up, get up. What? Okay, I'm gonna hop in the shower real quick. You get the kids ready, and then we'll get going. No, okay. hey, what? you just lay out their clothes because it takes me five minutes. Honey, That's perfect. Seriously. Well, we're already late for church. Hey, Brian. Go get yourself dressed. Did you pick up my stuff from the dry cleaners? Uh, oh. Make it, break it. Make it, break it. Make it, break it. Okay, Jack. I'm gonna make you waffles. Can I have a sandwich? Yes, but you gotta make it by yourself. Jack. Okay. This is all I could find, and the zipper's broken. All right, I'll go grab a safety pin. I have the high score! <sighs> Hannah, what are you doing? Daddy, I'm painting your fingernails. Well, that's great, sweetie, but go get dressed. Stay still. Okay. Honey. Hannah! Come on, let's go! Okay, everybody needs to eat. Here you go. I need one. Here you go. Okay, here you go. I forgot my shoes! Oh. Honey, we gotta go no. back. Nobody's taking off their shoes. And I want everybody to understand that we're working on <gasps> what? We made it. Yep. Our first scripture lesson on this third Sunday of Lent is uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the message that points to Christ on the cross just seems plain old dumb and stupid to those who are hell-bent on destruction, but for those that are on the way to salvation, it makes perfect sense. See, this is the way God works, and most powerfully as it turns out. It's written... I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as crackpots. So where is it you can find someone who's truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world and all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God in his wisdom took delight in using what the world considers dumb, you know, preaching, of all things, to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. So while the Jews clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for philosophical wisdom, we just go right on proclaiming Christ the crucified. Jews treat this as the anti-miracle. Greeks pass it off as something absurd, but to those of us who are called by God himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom all wrapped up in one. Human wisdom is so tinny, so impotent next to the seeming absurdity of God. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. Our second scripture this morning is from the second chapter of the Gospel of John, Verses 13 through 22. When the Passover feast celebrated by celebrated each spring by the Jews was about to take place, Jesus traveled up to Jerusalem, and he found the temple just teeming with people selling cattle and sheep and dove, 
loan sharks were also there in full force. So Jesus put together a whip made out of some strips of leather. He, he, he chased them all out of the temple, stampeded all the sheep and the cattle, upended the tables of the loan sharks, spilled all their coins left and right. And he told the dove merchants, get your things out of here and stop turning my father's house into a shopping mall. Well, that's when his disciples remembered the scripture, zeal for your house consumes me. But the Jews, well, they got all tore out of the frame. They said, well, what kind of credentials can you present to justify all this? And Jesus said, well, you just tear down this temple, and in three days I'll put it back together. Well, they were indignant. Took 46 years to build this here temple, and you're going to rebuild it in three days? But Jesus was talking about his body as the temple. Later, after he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said all this. And then they put two and two together and believed both what was written in the scripture and what Jesus had said. in majesty enthroned on high formed the dry lands and the waters sun and moon to mark the skies then you filled them who is like you God of love you form from dust your likeness in our human frame grieved as we chose to Abandon you and glorify our name. Yet you sought us. Who is like you?
Let us pray. Holy God, prepare our hearts for the reading and the proclamation of the word. May it challenge us, encourage us, inspire us, convict us. Thank you that your word is dynamic, that it's life-giving, that it's always relevant to our lives. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The focus for the message this morning is from this passage from uh, the book of Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 17. Now God spoke all these words. I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery. No other gods, just me. No carved gods of any size, shape, or form of anything, whatever, whether those things fly, walk, or swim. Don't bow down to them, don't, don't serve them because I am God and you know, I'm a jealous God, punishing the, children of it, punishing the children for any sins their parents pass on to them to the third and even to the fourth generation of those that hate me. But now I am unswervingly loyal to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. No, using the name of God in curses or silly banner, God will not put up with irreverent use of his name. Observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Work six days, do everything you need to do, but on the seventh day, well, that's a Sabbath to God. Don't do any work. Not your son, your uh, daughter, your servant, your maid, your animals, not even the not even the foreigner who's living in your town. Because you see, God made the earth and the heaven, the sea, and everything in it uh, in six days. And he rested on the Sabbath. Therefore, God blessed it. Set it apart as a holy day. Honor your father and mother so that you'll live a long time in the land that God, your God, is giving you. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lies about your neighbor, no lusting after uh, your neighbor's house or wife or servant or maid or ox or donkey. Don't set your heart on anything that belongs to your neighbor. Word of God for the people of God. I find that, that more and more people these days are using computers uh, than ever have uh, used computers before. Uh, some of you, even some of you senior citizens who are here this morning, are fair, have become fairly adept uh, at, at using computers. And as a result of that, you know as well as I do that just about every time you boot that rascal up, well, there's this inevitable flurry. All these pop-up messages you get, 
that, that let you know that you have been negligent in some way, that there's some way that you have failed to take care of your machine in the proper way. Now, some of these messages have a practical purpose. Those that remind you to update your software, that's, that's a pretty handy thing to have. Others are kind of ethical in essence, you know, telling you that you really do need to get down and purchase a license for that free trial shareware that you downloaded 30 days ago. And then you have that window that pops up that tells you you need to back up your computer and one that pops up inevitably when you attempt to perform a keystroke that the computer determines is out of bounds. You get one of those illegal function. Uh, like I, I'm always, when I get those, I'm always afraid that the computer police are going to show up in my office. And that's not even talking about all those hundreds of advertisements that seem to pop up like mushrooms on the Internet every time you log on. Now, we call these kinds of messages, we call them nagware, because that's exactly what they do. They are constantly nagging us to take some kind of an action. And it seems like that these things are programmed so that the more you try to ignore them, the, the more ubiquitous they become, the more irritated, the more frequent these things seem to become. But regardless of how irritating they are or how frustrating they might be, these constant reminders really do kind of serve a purpose. Well, maybe except for those ads, and, and I mean, who really wants those? Uh, updating your software is a smart thing to do because it keeps your, keeps your computer running smoothly, uh, prevents infection from all those myriad viruses that are floating around out there. Purchasing a license for that free trial software, well, that's just the right thing to do since somebody somewhere spent some time and energy and money and intellectual property to, to create what you have, what you're using. Backing up your computer regularly can save you a, an awful lot of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth when you have that inevitable computer crash or your computer just decides it's going to eat your data. Somebody asked me one time, says, what do you consider to be the, the, the rules of computing? And I say, there's only three. One, back up. Two, back up. Three, back up. See, it's important to do those kind of things. And there's pop-ups that warn you that you're about to do something catastrophically stupid. You ever get that one? Well, those things can keep you from crashing your computer altogether. Now, I know, I know computers crash, especially if you're running Windows, you're going to have crashes quite a bit anyway. In fact, somebody once defined the Windows operating system as the ability to crash all your programs at exactly the same time. Sometimes we really do need to have that question asked of us again and again. Are you sure you want to perform this operation? Click yes or no. The ones I hate are the one that pops up and says, your computer is now going to shut down. Okay. And I go, no, it's not okay. But you know, it might just be helpful if we had some similar pop-ups in the non-digital parts of our lives, you know. Wouldn't it be great, let's just say, if you kind of had that mental pop-up every morning to remind you to update your mental and spiritual health? And now, if you're tech-savvy enough, you can kind of probably program that kind of reminder into your a phone or into your calendar, but you know, you're still, you, it's something you still have to do. You have to actually make the effort to do that. It might also be helpful to have a reminder every day, do the right thing when we are confronted with some kind of an ethical choice, or maybe to keep you from making a bad choice. You know, are you sure you want to go nuclear on that cashier because she wants to charge you full price uh, for one of a twofer, click yes or no. Well, as it turns out, God gave the Hebrews just exactly such a reminder. 
one that wasn't all that easy to ignore, given the fact that they had to carry this message around, written on very bulky stones, kept in a golden box, everywhere they went. Sort of a God's equivalent of that restroom key that they attach to a brick, you know, so you won't steal it. I mean, who steals bathroom keys? The Ten Commandments, in fact, were to be a kind of positive nagware, if you will, for the Hebrews. It kept them updated over and over again about God's will. Made them stop and think before they did something catastrophically bad. Now, granted, they sometimes, just like we do, click the wrong box. But as the commandments provided a sort of baseline operating system, in which they could reboot or perform a system restore whenever there was a need. Now, if you've ever downloaded any computer software, you usually have to agree to a rather lengthy user agreement. It's called a EULA. Raise your hand if you've ever read one of those. Sure. Ever, what? You, nobody here has read that end user agreement? Well, hardly anybody does. I mean, who really reads those kinds of contracts? We don't read them because they're, one, too long, and they usually read, second of all, like they're written by good lawyers or a poor version of Shakespeare, you know, whereas the aforementioned entity of the first part known as the propriety entity of the second part known, you know, who understands all that? When we click agree, we're, what we're saying is that we are willing to abide by the covenant that is contained, you see, in that document, which includes all those pop-up nagware reminders that you hate. The software company just wants to make sure that you're using their product correctly while they, in return, get the kind of compensation that they feel like they deserve. And in effect, God is kind of doing the same thing here with the Israelites and, by extension, us today. Remember that God entered into covenant with Abraham that a great nation was going to come out of his family and that as a result of that, that all the human race, every family on earth was going to be blessed. And by the time of the Exodus, well, at least the multitude part of that had become a reality. God had rescued the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt. He took them out of that bondage. He was in the process of leading them to the promised land. And so now here they are camped at the foot of Mount Sinai, and God gives them this formal user agreement, these commandments as a constant pop-up reminder to keep that covenant and to use God's gift of freedom wisely and to use it for God's purposes. Now, when we commit these commandments to our mental hard drives, they help steer us to keep that commandment of love, the commandment to love God, to love others, as well as help prevent some catastrophic system errors in our own lives. Take, for example, pop-up number one. I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery. No other gods, only me. Now, of all the commandments, this one is probably the most important because it really drives the agenda for all the rest of them. If you really want to get to the root of it, technically, sin, all sin, is a result of idolatry. And idolatry is really nothing more or less than uh, putting something, anything, anyone, you see, ahead of God. And that includes ourselves. When we read the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when we read the story of the fall, they, they didn't get cast out of the Garden of Eden because they ate the forbidden fruit. They got cast out because they believed that they could be like God. This commandment was so important that God told the Hebrews that they needed to recite it daily in the form of the Shema. 
that they needed to bind it to their forearms, to their uh, arms, or their, put it on their doorpost. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. In other words, there is no part of human life whatsoever. No part of human life that is excluded from giving our full love and our worship to God. If we ignore that, then we are heading for a serious system crash. Pop up number two. The second commandment about not creating any idols makes the first one even more explicit. See, now, we, we tend, I think, a lot of times to, in our present day, to sort of ignore this one because we, we don't really have any, any stone or wooden gods that we actually literally bow down to. And so we don't think that we need to constantly update this spiritual software to exclude all those other gods that we have. But there are plenty of them out there. It may not be made out of wood or stone, but we still have plenty. Things like money and sex and power. I mean, after all, most human sin comes down to one of those three things, and those effects are far-reaching. Pop-up number three making a wrongful use of God's name, that third pop-up warns us against using the name of God for our own purposes. Now, a lot of folks, I know when I grew up, certain words were considered uh, bad words. We weren't supposed to say them. Uh, I remember one time I had in church a brand new family. Uh, they, they had never been church. They had a little boy. He was, he was about four years old, had never been in church. And I remember the very first Sunday that they were there. I was so excited. And so we, we were in the uh, middle of the worship service and I made some statement to the fact and, you know, I said, amen. Somebody else in the congregation said, hallelujah. And that little boy said the only word with God in it that he knew. You can imagine that that shut things down pretty quick. See, we tend to think that when the, the commandment says not taking the Lord's name in vain, that that's what it's referring to, that we're not supposed to use, this, use it in curses. But what it means is using God for our own ends. In the ancient world, when you invoke the name of a God, you did that so that you would guarantee that you get what you wanted. In our own day, we see this every time we turn on the TV. All you got to do is tune in and watch what goes on on Capitol Hill. We see folks that use the name of God to further their own selfish ambition, assuming that God blesses whatever it is we feel like blessing, and he hates whatever it is we feel like hating. Kind of like, kind of like clicking on a bad email link. God's Using God's name in the wrong way can introduce malware into our ability to be able to truly love and truly obey God. The fourth pop-up is that command to observe the Sabbath. It's a lot like a weekly reminder to sort of update and back up your spiritual, physical, mental hard drive. On the seventh day of creation, as it's related to us, the presence of God rested in creation. And, and that's very much the same tone and quality uh, as it, when it's referred to in Exodus that, that God's glory rested in, in the tabernacle and rested in the temple. The Sabbath is our opportunity to stop banging out more output and instead receive input from God in the form of our worship, prayer, listening to God, something all of us can use a little more practice at. A day set aside to reboot and recalibrate our lives to God's will and rhythm is essential to having that good, healthy, godly life. If we ignore that update, well, it leads to a system overload, renders us slow and ineffective for the kingdom of God. We need rest. We need to be reminded that God is, the ultimate, is, is ultimately the one who runs things and that we really should retire as general managers of the universe. 
Pop-up number five, honoring one's parents, the fifth commandment, ensures that the covenant of God is going to be constantly upgraded down through successive generations. If as parents, if we do not teach our children this covenant, if it is not followed and the authority is rejected, then the covenant itself is in jeopardy. Notice here that uh, this is one of the commandments, one of the few that has a condition that if you obey this command that you will, and I quote what the commandment says, that you will live long in the land that that God is giving you. Failure to do that will result in you being removed. And we read in the prophets that that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. If we fail to receive, if we fail to pass on the faith from generation to generation, then we risk our Christian community becoming as obsolete as a, as a 56 Edsel. Pop up six, seven, eight, and nine, murder and adultery. Commandments six and seven, both of these are, are kind of like malicious malware in the midst of our covenant community. In fact, Jesus considered these to be so heinous that he updated the commandments themselves, made them, uh, made an even more secure firewall, if you will. Don't murder? Well, how about, how about by starting uh, by not cursing or insulting other folks, even folks that have wronged you? Don't commit adultery? Well, well, how about not allowing your eyes to wander lustfully? These two, along with the eighth, ninth commandments against stealing and lying against another person, well, they're designed to protect the covenant in the community, the integrity of the community. Pop up number 10. Well, that's a prohibition against coveting reminds us that we don't have permission to want somebody else's spouse or somebody else's property enough that we take matters into our own hands to get it for ourselves. In fact, it's very often the case that it is the coveting that leads to all of our active violations of all the other commandments. Like any virtuous computer operator, it's important that we maintain all of our content filters that keep us from gazing at things and wanting things that that we just simply don't have permission to do. I think it was Will Rogers that said that most folks are, they want to be, uh, they want to be rid of temptation, but they want it to, uh, you know, they, they want it to keep in touch. And that's what we do. Sometimes we like to see how we like to see how close we can get our toes to the edge of the well before we topple in. We need to be reminded by these pop-ups of God that we should stay clear. So man and woman went to have their annual visit to church for the Christmas Eve service. You you know folks like that. They're regulars, they're church regulars. They show up regularly twice a year you know, for Easter and Christmas. So they, they came at Christmas time. And of course, the pastor, he was tickled to death to see him. And as he's standing at the back of the door and he's greeting them as they come out, he, he says to him, says, you know, it sure is nice to see you and your wife here, you know, for more than just once a year. And the fellow says, yeah, I know, I know. And I know we don't get here often, but, you know, at least we keep the Ten Commandments. Minister said, man, that's just, he said, I'm glad to hear that. I'm tickled to death. I'm glad to hear that you keep the Ten Commandments. Fellow said, yeah, she keeps six of them. I keep the other four. The Ten Commandments are pop-ups that we should never turn off, that we should never ignore, or take lightly, especially when they pop up. Because if they pop up, it usually means that we're facing some sort of temptation. 
See, they're kind of like early warning signs, if you will, that something is wrong, that something's out of kilter, that we have perhaps strayed too far. And God has put these in place. He's put them in place for our benefit. A lot of people think that these things are to be restrictive, but they're not. They are to, to give us a track to run on. They help us to live together as a community of faith. Because that's what they are, then we need to heed them. We need to listen to them. We need to keep our consciences constantly updated with them every day. Because that is the absolute best kind of nagware around. Let us pray. Loving God, you've gone to great risk for us. You became human. You allowed an element of uncertainty in your future. You gave your son the freedom to refuse. But Jesus took the risk of following. He took the risk of saying no to Satan in the wilderness. He took the risk of being rejected by those that, that knew him best. He took the risk that even his followers wouldn't recognize him for who he was. He took the risk of dying on a cross. Now, we sometimes like risking our lives, but only when it seems like it might get us a little more money or a little more power or maybe get folks to admire us a little bit more. But we shy away from the risk of giving it all away. Help us to take the risk of following you. You know, it's not easy for us to give you all who we are. We like to play it safe keep a portion of our lives back for our own purposes. So help us to say no to all those things that separate us from you. Help us proclaim what you've done for us even when we run the risk of alienating friends or family or loved ones. If you've got a cross for us, help us take it up. Help us know that giving our lives for you is the safest risk that we'll ever take. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, as you prepare to leave this place, be mindful that the cross of Jesus Christ calls you to rise to your better selves. Pick up that cross, my friends, and follow faithfully in the footsteps of Jesus Christ this week, the one who has gone before, the one who is, the one who was, the one who will forever be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen.